evening, Mr. Palmer. How are you, sir? Good morning, John. How are you? Now people are going to think you're in like Asia and I'm in the U S or something. And I'm, I'm realizing I'm going to have to leave it, but I guess my video somehow got unmirrored and it's really bothering me. I'm out of sync. I have no idea. Anyways, it's one of those days. It's Monday. It's, it's, it's Monday. It's actually evening, but I just thought I'd screw you up by saying good morning. Doesn't take much. <laughs> and we're off the rails in, in a really short amount of time. Now, we don't have anything major planned, just a, a minor chat about something important. Um, but I'm, I'm, I put a timer on it, and you can actually see the timer. Oh, yeah. 25 minutes. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to try and see if we can keep this to 25 minutes, folks. If it doesn't, then everybody who listened to this live gets a free R770. Well, you there's know. There's a big catch there, so there's, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. You're, you're, you're okay. <laughs> We're recording this. This Man, is not a live stream. Just... I, I, I did that once. I did that. I can't remember when I, I think I did that at WLPC where I actually clicked live stream and record and didn't remember that we were live streaming. Um, anyways, so now that I've completely blown everything up, um, complete with timer, what's on the agenda today, Mr. Palmer? So I've been doing a whole lot of work after WLPC, Mobile World Congress. And, you know, of course, the big news, you know, is I think as much as we talked about it last year, it's still going to be Wi-Fi 7. We still had, I still had so many different conversations about Wi-Fi 7, about, and especially six gigahertz. And so it's funny, we did a, we did an internal survey with um, a bunch of SEs, actually all the SEs and only a handful of them replied, but I probably shouldn't say that out loud, but anyway, um, there was one of the, one of the constant themes that I, that I've, I got in this survey response was some confusion between like Wi-Fi seven and Wi-Fi six E and six gigahertz and stuff like that. And so I think what we might do as we intersperse this between normal conversations with normal people and our top 10 um, series, I want to do some, I want to do a little bit of deep dives onto some six gigahertz things that maybe a whole lot of people don't understand. And so my favorite, maybe not your favorite, but my favorite is I want to talk about PSD or power spectral density. So that's kind of what I'd like to talk about today, if it's okay with everybody else. And Again, guess, if, if, they're, if they're listening live, they can object. So we'll give them a second. Yeah, I mean, is this, There's is nobody this like listening when, live? So is this, is, is, it's kind of like when I did when I did this at WLPC, I was like, you know what? This time is mine. Yeah. I want to talk about power spectral density. And since I have time, let's talk about power spectral density. And so you know, it's, it's 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 fair. I'm not objecting. <laughs> we'll see. So, you know, now everybody else has to hold their peace because nobody else objected. <laughs> It's true. So if you watch my WLPC presentation, this is kind of similar, but I've added some more things because of course we've done more work and I've done more research into this. I mean, and let's so, be realistic. A lot has changed since we left WLPC. Well, a lot has become more realistic. A lot has become more realistic, but more importantly, what's happened is, is our understanding of it. I mean, this might sound funny, but you know, WLPC was what a month ago, and yep. you know, we are we're learning so much, and we're we're sort of having time to digest everything that has happened and everything we talked about, and so now we have a little bit more understanding, or a little bit, you know, more, and so that's what I'm that's what I'm hoping to bring to everybody today, is this, you know, more insights into what we've learned and what we've realized about stuff around, especially around six gigahertz. And the fact that a Wi-Fi seven is not only six gigahertz. So I should probably have a different slide that says this why Wi-Fi seven, because it's backwards compatible to a certain extent ish. Um, it works at 2.4 and five gigahertz. You know, I've seen, I've seen networks, um, last year in, in the labs, where it was a Wi-Fi 7 AP running on 2.4 gigahertz with a wide open SSID. It's perfectly acceptable. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with doing that because there is a difference between 
the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band, and then this 6 gigahertz band that came in just recently. So while a lot of times those get conflated, you can't do that. Those are three different things. And so you just have to keep in mind that there are 6 gigahertz things and there are Wi-Fi 7 things. And sometimes they'll overlap if you're talking about 6 gigahertz, but oftentimes they don't. <clears throat> and PSD just happens to be one of them. This, wasn't, this isn't something that was introduced in Wi-Fi 7. This came about with six gigahertz and so uh, so it's applicable to wi-fi 6e and to wi-fi 7 but let's talk about psd so the first thing we want to talk about is this operating chart now this is something that i came up with based on a different chart that i saw that was very similar to this but i didn't like the way it was laid out and so i said you know i need to make it clear for me and all the work that i'm doing and so I came up with this chart. Now, something I will point out to everybody is that in the bottom left-hand corner, this is based off of Title 47, subpart 15.407A, 4 through 12, paragraph 4 through 12. And this is from the United States FCC. So this is for just the regulatory domain of the USA. Um, there are other... There are a lot of other different regulatory bodies. There's um, Etsy, there's Ofcom, there's all kinds of different standalone entities. I mean, there's there's just every country will have their own things. And so just because I happen to be working in the U.S. and all of my APs run with it, a country code of USA, I have to get, you know, this is what I use. But um, for other... And what I found in, in looking back and all the all the documentation and all the information is you're either following the USA and you'll know this based on which unis you are allowed to use. Now, most of the time, the chart says they all start at 5.925 gigahertz and then they'll go up, but they'll go up to one of two numbers. The first one being 6.425, uh, which is that first 500 megahertz of spectrum. The second number is the 7.125. And so depending on where you live and what, you know, bodies, you know, you, who controls your, your uh, spectrum, you're either going to be just uni five or you're going to be five through eight. <clears throat> and sort of following in conjunction with that is also the, this idea about standard power AFC controlled and low power indoor only modes of operation. If you only have the first 500 megahertz of spectrum, chances are you only have low power indoor mode. Um, if you have the whole chunk, you get all 1200 megahertz of spectrum, then chances are you're, you're either, you either already have an AFC that allows you to do standard power or you, you're, you don't have it yet, but it's in the, it's in the works. So those are the sort of the two different things. And we're going to get into that here in a little bit, but I want to talk about more importantly, the max PSD or power spectral density. And what you'll see here is, um, we're going to just pay attention to the low power indoor right now because standard power gets a little funky. Um, what you'll see is the client power is a minus one PSD whereas the AP power is a five PSD. You with me, John? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is like light reading topic for a, a Monday evening. I'm telling you right now, stuff like this, yeah. just, just as a, a quick, this is when I, when I tell, like when I was teaching RCWA stuff like this is what I tell why I say to people that you're learning Wi-Fi all over again. Well, yes and no. I mean, look, we still had EIRP values, right? We're still limited by EIRP. EIRP, for those of you who don't know, is called is effective isotropic radiated power. What that means is we take the power, or what we're measuring is the power that actually leaves the antenna, that actually leaves the device. And when you sort of backtrack through the devices, and all devices are the same in this regard, you have your antenna gain, plus 
or minus, I guess you could say, you have the, the gain of the antenna, but you also have loss between your antenna and the radio that actually generates the signal. So you have the radio that generates the signal and it sends it over something, whether it's a, sometimes it's a little wire, little cable, or it's a trace on the circuit board, or there's something, right? And so there's always going to be loss in there. And so EIRP is a calculation of the amount of energy that is generated by the transmitter minus the loss in the cable or in the trace and the path that it takes. Think of it as like free space path loss, but it's not free space. It's actually, you know, cables or traces or it's, it's, a, it's a hardware path loss, right? And then you get to the gain of the antenna. And so you take, if you have a plus 20, you have a minus 6 dB through your, your path loss. And then you have a plus 6 dB gain on your antenna array. You then end up with an EIRP of 20. It's 20 minus 6 plus 6. The 6 is plus, minus and plus cancel each other out. You end up with, you know, a 20 dBm EIRP. Now, we've always had these EIRP limits. They're 36 dBm. They've just existed since it's always been there. So whether or not you knew about it, whether or not you thought about it from a Wi-Fi perspective, these limitations have always existed. This isn't a new concept. What we're doing now is what's different is the power spectral density. So let's get into that part since we've now spent half the time talking, just getting to the point where we can talk about it. So I pointed it out on the chart. Then LPI client is minus one dBm and PSD is defined as dBm's per megahertz of channel bandwidth. So if you're, if you're a nerdy math guy like me, you go great. My client device that's running at six gigahertz will do minus one dBm per megahertz of channel bandwidth. So that's great. Let's, let's take a look at what that looks like. And we go, so if I have 160 megahertz wide channel and I'm, my client device can do minus one dBm, then I have minus 160 dBm of transmit power. Now, thanks to the odd way that it, uh, it works, even a minus 160 dBm is still a plus zero point and then 15 zeros and then a one milliwatt. You, you know, you, you can't ever actually get down to like zero milliwatts. Like you, you're always going to have some type of transmit power, even at a minus 160 dBm. But, you know, after you think about it, you go, wow, my phone transmitting it at, you know, that low of a transmit power makes no sense. So that cannot anywhere be close to being accurate. So then you go, all right, what if it's because I was using a minus one number? Maybe that's my problem, right? Maybe my math was screwed up because of that. Let's take the AP power. So the AP power is five dBm per megahertz of channel bandwidth. Great. So we take five dBm, we times it by 160 megahertz, which means that my AP that's transmitting on 160 megahertz wide channel is going to have 800 dBm of transmit power or one E plus 80 milliwatts. You didn't tell me there was going to be math tonight, Jim. Look, they complained about it at WLPC and, and it, the math's really not that hard. I mean, I mean, get out your little, you know, your little calculator, like I keep on my desk, right? And you just type in five times 160. And you get 800. That's it's easy math, John. I'm not, I'm not doing, I mean, five times 160. That, that's easy. Now the conversion is a little more difficult because, you know, converting DBM to milliwatt isn't as quite as easy as, <laughs> as my, my fourth grade math problems. <sighs> and so I had to take, I had to take one E plus 80 milliwatts and dump that into a converter. Cause you know, I can't, I, that number just doesn't work for me. Right. It's more than fourth grade math. So of course that comes up with a metric boatload of wattages. I mean, <laughs> that is a trademarked industry standard. Well, it is now. So, well, it needs, needs to be no. a sticker. The metric boatload of wattages. We should do. We should do something like that. Yeah. But so, as you can see, that is not the right way to calculate PSD. However, there is a right way, and the right way is you got to actually do a little conversion. And this is where John's math is going to get harder on a Monday evening. 
because you have to convert the DBMs to milliwatts, um, which isn't too bad. There's actually a, um, a reference figure, which is zero DBM is equal to one milliwatt. And that's a radio standard. Um, hate to break it to you, but it's not just Wi-Fi. All radios use the same standard. So when we take a look at our numbers above the minus one and the five DBM, and we convert those into milliwatts, now all of a sudden you get for a client 0 0.79 milliwatts. You know, that's your LPI maximum client power spectral density, and then 3.16 for an AP. So because our, let's just focus on APs just so we can get through this real quick. So if you take 3.16 milliwatts and you times that by 20 megahertz, you get 63.2 milliwatts or 18 dBm. So in the US or any country code that follows the PSD of 5 dBm per megahertz of channel bandwidth for an AP, the maximum transmit power you can have is 18 dBm on a 20 megahertz wide channel, which coincident, coincidentally enough is where the management frames go out. Even, you know, even in five gigahertz, you know, when you run wider channels, we're still using that 20 megahertz wide primary channel as where all of our, all of our management frames go out of. So 18 dBm. Now that's something I can get my head wrapped around. That's something that makes sense to me. You with me, John? Sure. I may have so, this back, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the maximum that you can turn up your AP in six gigahertz when you're doing a design for low power indoor is 18 dBm. That's it. That's, that's what the maximum allowed transmit power is. Now, when you take a look at it at say a data channel, because you're like, you're crazy and you're like, Hey, I'm the only one in my neighborhood that has a, has a six gigahertz AP or I can't see anybody else when I go and look. And so I'm going to run 160 megahertz wide channel. Then you get 27 dBm. Now, coincidentally enough, the reason why we have power spectral density is if, if you know that I, the concept of every time you double your channel bandwidth, you add three dB of noise and you go from 20 to 40. 40 to 80, and then 80 to 160. Now, now we're getting into third grade math, John, so keep up with me. If you have 3 dB plus, you know, times 3, 3 times 3, that's, we've now added 9 dB of noise into our channel. Now, 27 minus 18 just happens to be 9 this is easy math, John. I don't know what everybody's complaining about. <laughs> this is like third and fourth grade math, right? I mean, this isn't hard uh, math. Maybe it used to be. Well, math, third and fourth grade math isn't what we went to school for, but that's a different topic for an entirely different podcast on a different channel. But, that's, but anyways, that's where that's where the ninety B comes from, right? Because now we're able to standardize and we're able to focus on the SNR. So our SNR value is the same. So that's where all that comes from, right? Now, the last thing I want to do is we're going to take all this and we're going to come back to what I was talking about earlier with EIRP, right? Now, this all works. Here's my values. We got 20, we got 80, we got 160s. And you can see, you know, if I were to add in um, a 40, then it'd be right there at 21 dBm, right? 3 dB extra noise, 3 dB extra transmit power. It's simple. Right. But now when we take in that last number and we combine it in there, up oh, a little too far on that, our ERP values are 30 dBm. So this means that when the designers who do our controllers, they actually know how much loss we have through our APs plus the gain of the antenna. So they will, they will allow us to set a transmit power that's going to violate the EIRPs. But in the when you look at places like the US where we have that almost 3 dB of overhead of cushion, we can creep right up next to that 30 dBm of EIRP value, right? So we have a little bit of wiggle room in there. We got some space. And if you're running 80s, you know, you're just like, hey, you know what? I'm just gonna run 80s across the board. 
you got six db of antenna gain in your overhead so that's that and that overhead gain from your antenna is not just what is the gain of my antenna but it's what's my loss and then offset by my gain so if you have 6 db of loss like we were talking about before right you're now looking at you look at it 18 dbm is reaching the antenna but then you can add in 12 db of gain of antenna gain in order and you're still below eirp values so when i when i mentioned that the on the us we live in the land of milk and honey this is one of the reasons why is because of this eirp value that we're looking at here but for all of our brothers and sisters that don't live in the land of milk and honey let's talk about etsy limitations for a second and this is um the same across all of the eu um so Switzerland. I'm a little slow, but that yeah. felt because I feel bad for them. You look at this chart and you can't feel, you can't help but feel bad for them. You just well because they they, they don't get things. 1200 megahertz. And no. and here's the thing: it's not even it's not even just the EU, right? Um, like Japan, um, Australia, they only get 500 megahertz. So I'm really hoping that you know somebody lobbies and pushes hard for you guys to get more more spectrum however it's not just about the spectrum i'm going to walk through something else real quick and this will just rain on everybody's tuesday morning parade so their psd limitations are a little different than ours so in the eu you get 10 dbm per megahertz which nicely enough is actually 10 milliwatts per megahertz but you got an eirp limitation of 23 dbm right so when you take a look at a 20 megahertz wide channel using psd you end up with 200 milliwatts or 23.01 dbm so if you have any gain in your ap on the antenna arrays or antenna elements period that doesn't that it does more than offset your loss between the radio and the antenna, you have to turn the power down. And that's at a 20 megahertz wide, right? Now, if you go, you know what? We have 500 megahertz of spectrum, so we're going to run 40 megahertz wide, you know, because we have, you know, that many channels. Now we can get away with running 40s anything that you go above 20 megahertz wide is going to cause you problems if the gain in your antennas offset the loss and then some so at 80 megahertz wide because you're like i'm gonna run in a lab you're now looking at 29 dbm of transmitted power but you're 6.03 db above eirp limits so not only do people in the EU need to have, you know, more spectrum, there's also a PSD thing that's going to come back and haunt them until this is fixed. I mean, I can't, I can't help but wonder, and, and maybe we do have some, some EU and, and APAC SEs that we could certainly bug. Um, we might have to call in a favor to get them to, to stay up late or get up early. But I, I almost wonder, knowing that you're getting less spectrum, even though we need all the spectrum we can get around the world, but you're getting less spectrum and even more crazy restrictions. You, you kind of almost wonder if there, somebody's going to sit there and say, is it even worth it? Well, here's the thing. It is right. Because we need more channels. That's just, the, that's just the long and short of it. Right. We need more channels. Now in the, in the plus side, it's not, I mean, most people don't turn their APs, up to the highest transmit power anyway when they do designs most of the design tools the default transmit powers are below the maximum so it then becomes a question of well what happens especially with psd where those numbers fluctuate right if you turn the power down a little bit how does that impact the way that it calculates your controller platform calculates what is your transmit power and the honest truth is, John, and I'm not and take off any ruckus thing that I have. The honest truth is we don't know you just yet. 
because it is still something that has been, it's so new that we are still sort of struggling to understand how this works, that we don't, we honestly don't know how this is going to, you know, how, how's this going to work, you know, and, and as even, even without AFC, which adds the, the extra wrinkle. So just the, the, the wrinkle for, for, uh, AFC is it doesn't give you any of these DBM numbers that we're seeing up here. It gives you the EIRP limitation. So then you have to reverse engineer based on what your EIRP limitations to figure out what's your allowed transmit power. So luckily the people who do the controller code do the math for us. So we don't have to think about it all the time, but it still then brings to mind, how are we going to troubleshoot? How are you going to see how this works? in a you know in a network because you're doing a passive scan of the network you're only looking at the beacons and then you're extrapolating extrapolating out how wide that channel is based on the information in the in the uh, beacon frame itself so you're not actually measuring the power of the data frames that are being sent out at a higher transmit power so even if you can calculate it out and you can be like you know what we're always going to be at 23 dBm EIRP. 20 dBm EIRP is still better than zero. It's still better than having nothing, right? So don't look a gift horse in the mouth. We need six gigahertz. We need a six gigahertz in the EU. You know, some of the EU doesn't even have all of five gigahertz. So they need every single channel they can get their hands on. And so while it's a bummer and it's depressing when you think about it, it's you don't ever look at it and say, well, why do we bother? Well, we bother because we still need the spectrum. We still need it, even if it is with such limitations. But it also means back to your point about relearning Wi-Fi. It's understanding that there's all these other little caveats that come with having six gigahertz. And then when you combine that, let me just throw this little nugget out to you to break your brain tonight and into tomorrow. It wasn't already broken. <laughs> A lot of things that we set for networks, we set at the WLAN level. And if you have the same WLAN that works on five gigahertz and six gigahertz, because you want the reduced neighbor report to work and, you know, for the AP to tell everybody on, and then not in a reduced neighbor report on five gigahertz. Hey, by the way, I got the same network over here on six gigahertz. Go to this channel over here. Um, there's some different settings within a WLAN that has to do with RF. And so you were, so some settings that you've made traditionally in the past without thinking about it um, can come back and bite you in the future when you enable that same SSID on six gigahertz because you can't think about it. You know, I'll throw the one out the bit me. Join RSSI threshold. Yeah, I mean. That's set at the WLAN. But it applies to all the bands that it's running on. So what you're saying to be a, I'm going to be that troll. It sounds like we need a, a Wi-Fi 7 specific SSID. And I'm going to duck because there's, there's a shoe thrown at me. I know, I know we can't. But I mean, th th this, <clears throat> this is really the crux of why I said, like, I feel like, and I said it in my RCWA and I've said it before, like, I almost feel like I'm going to need to resit my CWNA and, and go through the basics again because it's just, for, well, first of all, CWNA is always a good class. People love the book. It's a Bible. If you get a good instructor, it's worth it. But there's just, a, there's a lot of new stuff. And it's, even if it's not new, like to your point, PSD is not new with Wi-Fi 7. There's a lot of bits and pieces in here that if you're not in those weeds all the time, I'm not, you are. Um, if you're not in the weeds enough, or often enough or recent enough, however you want to put it, this is going to be a lot that comes back. And, you know, to your point about troubleshooting and support, if you're a global organization, if you're a teacher, I mean, it used to be you sit in front of the class, you say like one, six and 11 are my non overlapping channels in 2.4. It's a little bit different. You've got a couple different channels in, in APAC and EU. That's it. No big deal. Now. I mean, it's, it, I could be wrong. I probably am. I usually am. But it feels like 
This is going to be the most distinct difference for Wi-Fi from country to country, or from, I should say, from governing body to governing body, that you can't make a blanket statement anymore. I mean, you probably shouldn't have been making blanket statements anyways, but a blanket statement that works in the U.S. is going to be decidedly different and actually in violation of, at the moment, everything else everywhere else in the world. But to troll our our brethren around and sisters around the world, everybody wants what the U.S. has for Wi-Fi because we got it best. Um, <laughs> but it, it's just it's a lot, and and you know the we've talked about it before on here and you know in side chats. The last couple of years have been really rough for Wi-Fi professionals because there was a lot of time, and there still is, spent out of the office. We're we're not getting the same hands-on. We're not getting the same experience. Uh, or people are starting to go back in the office and starting to happen. But now you've got six that kind of got skipped over six E that definitely some did and some didn't skip over. And you got Wi-Fi seven. It's a whole, I mean, it really is a whole new world. Um, it's exciting. Like you said, we need six gigahertz. We will find a way to screw it up. Don't worry. Give us a couple of years, but we needed it and it'll get used, but it's just, it's a lot. And, and I mean, think about what's happened in the last six months, right? AFC became official last uh, month. You know, speaking from the ruckus thing, because we, we are a ruckus podcast, we wear our ruckus hats, um, the VSC7 code dropped about a month ago. The R770 started shipping last year. We've got more coming. Um, so it's we've been hearing so much about it, and now everything is starting to move. So it's going to be exciting. Like you said, WLPC made a huge difference for a lot of us because it went from theoretical to practical. And maybe, I mean, there was definitely some hands-on there. There was a lot of people imparting us with their their hands-on knowledge of what they've done with Wi-Fi 7. The next 6 to 12 months could be extremely exciting. It's going to be extremely uh, drink-through-the-fire-hose feeling, I think. Maybe not the fire hose. Drink from the ocean is probably more apt. But it's exciting because, you know, again, I wasn't getting it. I wasn't, I mean, I was around. I was alive, obviously. I'm not that young. But... When 5 gigahertz, I wasn't a CW mini at the time when 5 gigahertz became a thing in Wi-Fi. So for a lot of us, it's, I mean, not a lot of us, but for some of us, it's the first time we're getting new new spectrum, new opportunities. It's just, it's so much. It's so much. And it's just, yeah, I just, I can't, I, yeah. And you just melted my brain on a Monday night. Thank you. Well, here's, here's the thing. If, and I hate Sorry to melt your brain. I didn't mean to. <laughs> but here's the thing, right? To me, it's not about learning it tonight or learning it today or learning it whenever you listen to this or watch this. It's it's about knowing what we don't know or knowing what you don't know, right? I don't expect you to take what I've what I've talked about and internalize it to the point you could stand up in front of a group and explain it. What I'm hoping to do is I'm hoping to at least tickle your brain a little bit so that when this question comes up in the future, you go, wait a second, Jim and John were talking about this. Let me go back and, and cause he, they mentioned this might be a thing or this mentioned this might be a problem or you know, there's all these other weird oddities that, that, that are happening that I didn't really have to deal with in the past. Right. Sure. And so it's, it's about, it's, it's about, just educating you that there are some differences in how this works. There's some differences in, in how this is going to be deployed. You know, there's there, like I was talking about with the join RSSI threshold that 100% bit me because I spun up a brand new SSID for my brand new uh, Wi-Fi seven AP that I got sitting over here on the floor. And I did my default settings and it's almost like muscle memory at this point when I went in and I was like, Oh yeah, I set the join RSSI threshold at like neg 70. And that screwed me. <laughs> and so, but it's one of those things where if you talk about it and you hear people like us talk about it, it's something that you know, maybe you remember and you go, Oh, you know what? I'm having these weird issues. I'm having these odd issues. This could possibly be a thing. Let me go check this. Let me go Google it. Let me go research it. Let me go look for this stuff. That's why this is, that's why we're doing this, John. It's not to try to teach you right now to the point you can stand up and teach it to somebody else. Oh, God, no. It's, <laughs> <laughs> well, what you're I mean, saying is we finally got to the point where, like, because it's it's a thing. Keith always says it at WOPC that eventually you've been doing this long enough 
and you could contribute enough that you Google something and you find the answer from yourself. So yeah. it only took me like a decade and maybe I'll get there, but no, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a lot to take in. I mean, I think, and, and honestly for me, my exposure to PSD, I think started when I was just going through high level and looking at them like, wait a minute, the power levels look kind of funky, just like raw levels, not PSD included. And I'm like, I don't understand how Wi-Fi, uh, Wi-Fi seven, how six gigahertz is going to be worth it for outdoor. You know, if you're talking about distances, high pole mounts, stuff like that, like it seemed underpowered for whatever I, and I can't remember what I was looking at, but then you were like, but wait, did you factor in PSD? And I'm like, huh? And, and, you know, but again, it's, it's stuff, like you said, it's been around, but if you don't know, you don't know. And I didn't know. And I know a little bit more than I did, but it's, it's just, it's part of the new world. But here's the other thing to keep in mind, right? Is like you're, you're talking about outdoor for those people that live in a regulatory domain that's lucky enough to get outdoor and AFC, you know, you're looking at a, and maxi IRP of 36 DBM, which is what it is in five gigahertz. And so assuming you can get the transmit power, assuming that you can still run your gains on the antennas, the fact that there's not a whole lot of devices in six gigahertz means that you have much lower noise floor. And so it's still very applicable to be used outdoors assuming you have that right any amount of spectrum we get even with limitations we need to understand is still a gift we didn't pay for this spectrum i mean we might have felt like we paid for it but but in the end of the day we're not like a cell company that went to auction and bought you know even 500 megahertz worth of spectrum because that would cost you a whole lot we just couldn't afford it and so this is a gift and you know it does have limitations, but once you sort of learn and once you understand that there's limitations, then it's easier to deal with the one thing at a time because, you know, yeah, five gigahertz really came into its own in AO 2.11N when they, you know, they went, hey, we're going to do dual band. But don't forget that there was 802.11A that was doing OFDM in 1999. Now, granted, you didn't, couldn't, get, you couldn't get the gear till 2000, but, you know, it's still, when you look at it today, they're still, you know, they'll still be like, oh, it's 802.11a when you look at it in Wireshark, right? At five gigahertz, it'll be like, yeah, it's 802.11a, it's OFDM. Well, you know, it took us, it took us 24 years to learn everything we know about five gigahertz. It's going to take us maybe, hopefully not 24 years to figure out (laughs) six gigahertz, but it's still going to take us a little bit of time. So don't, don't feel angry, don't feel agitated, don't feel discouraged if you don't know and understand this because you're just, you're learning with the rest of us, you know, so embrace the unknown, embrace the fact that, hey, there's a lot we still don't know. And half of the stuff we say today is probably going to be wrong in the future. So, and, and the beauty part, we'll probably do, because I know you're going to love it. We're going to probably do more Wi-Fi 7 podcasts between now and the end of the year. It's again, well, but it's just, it's, there's so much new coming out. Um, you were, you were talking about a, a certain trip you've got coming up in a couple of weeks where you're probably going to learn more and it's just going to continue to go and go and, and it'll, you know, ultimately all the different events, right? You've got a, a few more WLPCs coming up. We just had one, um, those kinds of events, getting around for bake-offs, getting the gear into the customer's hands, which is, is happening. It's all going to give us more and more information, more experience. And, you know, Jim and John talking about PSD in, you know, September, October is going to be a vastly different conversation where I'm probably going to look a lot, le- hopefully look a lot less glossed over with my eyes. I'm not going to look like a le- less out, less out of it because we'll have the experience. Um, so it's a very, yeah, again, drinking from the ocean is an apt comparison, but I still think it's, it's an exciting time to be a wireless engineer. It is, you know, and I think part of it, you know, and we've sort of touched around this, but you know, Wi-Fi 6E was never fully embraced by the vendors. You know, I thought, I thought Ruckus and our two APs were sort of falling down until I, I went that way. I just went and looked at everybody else and went, wait, you know, we're not the only ones with two and most of them have three and maybe there's one vendor that has four. So it wasn't fully, fully embraced, 
by any vendor. Yeah. So that's not a secret. You can just go look it up. Um, because we knew that Wi-Fi 7 was coming, right? I mean, you, when you think about the timing of everything, Wi-Fi 6 was 2019. We're now 2024. So we're, you know, but we're four or five years after that. And 6E came two years ago. So we're, you know, it was never fully embraced because we knew Wi-Fi 7 was coming. We knew that Wi-Fi 7 was being built from the ground up to deal and, and take advantage of 6 gigahertz. And so it's, it's, Wi-Fi 7 was always going to be this learning experience for everybody. And so just like, you know, people will poo-poo wife or can't even call it Wi-Fi number 802.11a as being, you know, worthless. It wasn't. We There was a lot that was learned by that. And then we're still based things off of that. So don't feel bad. You know, don't, don't be too hard on yourself, everybody. Um, just know that these things exist and know that, yeah, you're going to have to do a little bit more homework when these questions come up because it is just homework. different. Yeah, I homework. know. Homework. Come on, man. It's a podcast. We don't want homework. Well, oh. it's, not, it's not my deep dive where I, you know, <laughs> give you homework. So yeah, you've got a reputation for that. <laughs> Excuse me. Anyways. Um, yeah. I, I think we've just about gotten PS PTSD from PSD. Bad joke. <laughs> So I don't know. Do you have anything else to, to, to close this one out, Jim? No, I think I've I think I've gone through enough third and fourth grade math for tonight. We can uh, we can wrap this one up and just again the only don't feel bad if you didn't get it the first pass because I sure didn't. There you go, folks. Well, all right, Mr. Palmer. I will catch you on the next one. Have a good yep. good evening. And uh, yeah, let's. Uh, I'm looking for something. I swear. There we go. All right, man. Have a good one. I'll talk to you later. If you want to contact the show directly, you can email us using the address ruckcast at comscope.com. To learn more about Ruckus products and services that we may have talked about on this or any other podcast, please check the links in the About section of the show.